morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank particularly Jeritis' uh, Stephen Oppenheimer and Premananda Priyadarshi for suggesting this approach. Uh, I'll begin by saying that the Orient debate exists no more. Please look at the second part of the 200-year question. Because there are two points we have to worry about. First, why should we know these things? First, uh, especially to young people, I will tell you, you have been totally misled, as I was misled, for several decades, probably centuries, at least as long as I can remember, that our origin, both as humans and the origins of our civilization, goes back to Central Asia and Europe. What science tells us today is the exact opposite of that. So the first part of my observation is that the, what these supposedly linguistics and literary studies have been telling us uh, makes us and our languages and culture move in one direction and what science tells us um, it makes it move in the opposite direction from India outwards, not outwards to India. So origin and spread of Indian civilization 60,000 to 3,000 before the, the, uh, before the common era. That's the title of my talk. So let me begin by looking at what is the Orient debate? I will call it the non-debate. There is no debate anymore. Okay? People will keep talking about it because uh, they have been doing it for years and uh, you, know, you cannot teach an old dog new tricks. They have to keep saying things that they were doing. The Orient myth doesn't need a debate anymore. What the Orient myth needs today is a burial. People will not let it go simply because there are too many people involved uh, uh, with the interested parties involved in that. Arya in Sanskrit is an adjective. It does not refer to a people. Maha kula kuli narya sabhya sajjana sadhavaha. This is what Amarakosha says, which is the authoritative thing. And contrary to what you people and I have been told for decades, the Arya concept was not very important in the Vedic literature. It is simply a polite form of address. Hmm? In the Vedic literature, the Rigveda, when I say Vedic literature, to me Rigveda is the most foundational work um, and the most important. Uh, there are 10 books and more than 10,000 mantras. The word Arya appears exactly 38 times. If you pick up Hitler's Mein Kampf, you may see the word Arya 38 times in a single page. So it's a European obsession and not an Indian obsession. Okay, please understand. Um, it's neither a race. The race is not a scientific concept anymore. For example, if I take the genome of some person and give it to somebody and find out whether he's an Aryan or Dravidian or somebody, no scientist can tell you. Science cannot tell you that. Okay? And it is not a language. It is not a nation. And I will suggest some modifications to the way we look at the people of India. So new developments in history, what I will tell you is after two centuries, Methods based on linguistics are giving way to science. What was done, because they discovered similarities between Indian and European languages, they took those similarities and tried to find out where, where the movement was. And because they were in Europe and they were European scholars, they said the movement came from Europe to India. What I have done is to reverse this. Now we have the science, genetics, fossil evidence, and also evidence of animals and all those kinds of things which allows us to trace the movement of people. So once we have the movement of people, we can say the languages also went in the same direction. Since the Pilgrim Fathers in England went from England to America, it's very easy to explain why English came to uh, uh, America. Americans speak English. Because the, the same is true of Australia. Why did English come to India? Because the Englishmen came here and ruled for 200 years. Even then, a very small proportion used So. What has allowed us to achieve this breakthrough? Again, I have to thank uh, Stephen Oppenheimer of Oxford for bringing it to my attention. Uh, were two major discoveries in natural history. One natural and the other relating to humans. Uh, this has allowed us to push the origins of human civilization, of Indian civilization in particular, by more than 50,000 years. If you look at the standard textbooks, uh, they will tell you Rigveda 1200 years, 1200 BC or something like that. What we are saying is it should, the origin should go back at least 50,000 years more. Okay? And this is scientific basis. 
I'm not making it up. I mean, it's not based on superficial. Human advance is a gene mutation 80,000 years ago allowed humans to become a speaking species. Another, a natural disaster, a natural event, uh, a super volcanic eruption 73,000, 74,000 years ago uh, nearly wiped, wiped out all the humans. In fact, it wiped out all the humans in the world who are not our ancestors, that is, who are not Homo sapiens sapiens. There were many other species. I mean, there were several other species of humans. Uh, you know, Neanderthals are one, but then Neanderthals survived. We don't know if they spoke or not. Okay. So, message of is that history follows nature. So, human history is the record of the human response to changes in natural history. And natural history changes tend to be both catastrophic and continual. Okay. And then another, the first one, of course, was what is known as a transcription gene, uh, FOXP2, about 80,000 years or more. It doesn't matter the exact date. You know, we are looking at very big, if you miss it by one or 5,000 years, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Uh, another was the Toba explosion. Uh, a small group of our African ancestors migrated to settle in South Asia, South Asia coast, including part, a few of them in Arabia. We don't know if they survived. But they definitely did survive in the uh, in South Asia, that is in India, with the Indian subcontinent. Okay, this is the key finding of the last 30 years of uh, human population genetics research. All non-African humans in the world today, Europeans, Australians, uh, American Native Americans, all these are descended from this group of humans in India, who survived here for 50,000 and more years here. This is the evidence of science. That has to be the starting point. You can disagree with other things. I mean, even here you can disagree on details. And we may have to change if we have more data available. On the basis of all the data available today, this is what we can say with fair confidence. And the, the work is mainly due to uh, geneticists. So first I will spend about five minutes pointing out how we happen to get into this mess of this false history being taught about Aryans, Dravidians, and all that. So one, of course, after William Jones so supposedly discovered Sanskrit in 1786, please understand it, the relationship or the similarities between Indian and European languages were known at least 200 years before, uh, uh, before William Jones. It was known to Steve Thompson, Thompson, who was another, uh, Filippo Sassetti, these people had noted the same thing. They were in Goa as traders and priests. Okay, the Aryan myth and the Aryan invasion, both have been demolished by science. But the search for the ancestor of Sanskrit, Greek, and so on, it remains a challenge. That is the real 200-year-old question. Uh, two things, one, of course, uh, German nationalism, and another was the British colonial interest to create an Indian elite that would identify with the British masters. So they gave the Indian subjects an identity saying that you are, uh, you belong to the same branch that we do. We are the same long separated brothers. Okay? Uh, it is supported mainly by, today, by academics with vested interests in the methodology and teaching these subjects. Those departments are also closing. Uh, and worried about careers and reputations, and of course, Dravidian politicians. Okay, so uh, politics of Aryan theories. I will take just two minutes because I have more important and interesting things to talk about. Uh, but I want people to have a very clear idea uh, that this was purely a political creation. Uh, some of them believed it. That doesn't make it any different. Uh, you know, a lot of people believe in the flat Earth also. That doesn't make the Earth flat. Uh, uh, German nationalism and British imperial interests. Okay, German nationalism is not relevant here. Hmm? In Europe, Arya is a dirty word, unfortunately, like swastika. We had nothing to do with it, but it happened. Okay, German nationalism is not pertinent to our, what we are talking about. So, let us look at a very interesting statement. Uh, this, I wrote this part of a press statement in England some time back, which went, came on the BBC. The Aryan invasion theory gave a historical precedent uh, to justify the role and status of the British Raj, who could argue 
that they were transforming India for the better in the same way that the Orients had done thousands of years earlier. So the British were a new and improved brand of Orients uh, of the Vedic people who were here to improve, to civilize India. And this was, uh, about, in order, to, this was stated by British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin in the Parliament, that's the House of Commons in 1929. Now after ages, the two branches of the great Orient ancestry have again been brought together by Providence by establishing British rule in India. God said to the British, I have brought you and the Indians together after a long separation. It is your duty to raise them to their own level as quickly as possible, brothers as you are. So the older brother must lift the younger brother. I mean, all this has been available, 1929. What are Indian historians do, been doing all these years? I mean, I'm an outsider. I'm primarily a mathematical physicist. If I could find out, why couldn't they do it? Why are they writing those textbooks? And why are they still using those textbooks? Hmm? So the academic agenda today is as well as DMK, prop, uh, the DMK politicians, is to keep Harappan archaeology separated from Vedic literature and ideas. Harappan archaeology should have alerted them that they, their theory was wrong. I will show you in one minute why it is so. Hmm? So they are supposed to have overcome the, um, uh, the Dravidian uh, thing of uh, the Harappans. But it, Dravidian is not merely Dravidian. It is non-Aryan. So what it is is now, uh, you see, they have been paying some Western scholars. If you, you may, they pay, pay 10 lakhs to Asko Parpola of Finland, who claimed that, uh, who has been saying that it's a version of Tamil. If it is Tamil, why can't they read it? Even I read Tamil. So it's, uh, uh, so this is now the agenda to keep the north and south separated by claiming that the Harappan archaeology is, uh, you know, uh, uh, represents Dravidian. I mean, for that they spent 10 lakhs. You pay somebody 10 crores, uh, they will say that uh, Punjabis built Mahabalipuram or something of that kind. You know that you, you can do that, or they built the Egyptian pyramids. So this kind of uh, scholarship should not be, okay? But Harappans were Vedic, that's very clear, the Vedic influence on the Harappans. All you have to do is to look at some of those icons. What are these? These are Vedic Yogasanas. And this is the famous Pashupati seal, uh, which is in uh, some... In, uh, I'm not a practitioner of yoga. A yoga expert told me it is known as Mula Bandhasana. Hmm? And this is the Omkara Mudra. It's the Om seal. And to make it, to show you how it is related to Om, please see the left one, one on the left is the Harappan Om, which is very similar to Om in Kannada and Telugu, which is most, many Kannada and Telugu letters you get by rotating the Devanagari letters by 90 degrees. And the second one is the Devanagari Om, what you, as you write in Hindi and uh, Sanskrit. All this has been available for 90 years. Huh? And this is the famous Panchaswasti, Swasti. And I, the, the, the Jhas reading gives you Panchaswasti Advma or Panchaswasti Vidma. Uh, Vidma means knower, Advma means nourished. Uh, Swastina Indro Vruddhashrava, Swastina uh, Vishwaveda, that's the famous opening lines of Taitiri Aranyaka. So, a postulated Indo-European homeland from which its speakers are said to have separated, etc. Linguistics moves language in one direction, these linguistic theories. That is from Europe to India. But I will show you in, in, the, in the rest of the lecture, our findings based on genetics moves it in the opposite direction. Okay? So, revisiting Indian civilization... Vedic, Harappan, popular, etc. come from a common source. What is this common source? Before we talk about Indo-Europeans, we should be able to decide what is Indian. You know, the thing is, without any definition, these people are not trained in sciences. Understand, most of them were theologians, priests, missionaries, uh, government bureaucrats, and those kinds of people. They had no scientific training. And 19th century science believed that the world was created in 4004 BC, 23rd of October, uh, the Sunday at 9 a.m., that is two hours uh, or something of that kind. So it is pure. Uh, uh, th that's all the science they knew. Hmm? The main thing is Indians have lived where they are today for thousands of years with minimum ex uh, external input, but have made, made several out migrations. Even today, India is densely populated. You have more people leaving India than coming into India, hmm? except during the, the, the medieval period. So what does the genetic evidence say? 
the leading authority on human population genetics in the world to, today is Luigi Luca Cavalli Sforza. He was a student of Aurea Fischer. Another famous student of Aurea Fischer was our own C.R. Rao, the great statistician, who happened to be my teacher at Indiana when I was there. We didn't discuss genetics. But the basics, once you understand the mathematics, uh, is the same. The M17 genetic marker shows the greatest diversity in South Asia that is here. That means it's the oldest here. Okay? All non-Africans in the world today are descended from... Okay? And summary of evidence, here is what Kavali Sforza says. Indian tribal and caste populations derive from the same genetic heritage of Pleistocene southern and western nations and have received limited gene from external sources. That means 50,000 years uh, before present. Data now available shows our African ancestors first settled in coastal regions. If they came along the coast, they must have settled in coastal regions. So from there, they moved to the interior. So there was no invasion from the north, but a spreading out. And that was determined by climate. Okay? So with this background, there is no need to refute at every stage um, this Aryan myth and any kind of these things. Let us now start with a clean slate. So <coughs> India was a major center for people, plant, and animal domestication in the last 60,000 years, especially in the last 10 to 12,000 years. Most animal domestications, including the horse, took place in India. Horse domestication took place in several places, in, including Spain. And that the determination, all that took place in the last 10,000 years, when the Ice Age ended, okay? So peopling of the world, this is a simplified map. I'll give you a better one. You start from this uh, slightly erroneous map. So it comes to India. From India, it branches out to other places, both to Australia. Hmm? And this is a more elaborate map uh, by uh, Bradshaw Foundation, which has supported Stephen Oppenheimer's work. So this is the branching, I mean this, Essentially, including, so about 35, 40,000 years ago, uh, people from India moved to the Central Asia and west, further west, north and north west, into Europe, to, east, to Europe, Eastern Europe, Eurasia, and Europe. Hmm? So, two drivers of human movements. One was spoken language 80,000 years uh, before present. It doesn't matter if it was 80, 75, 90, or something. Okay, it happened before the Toba explosion of 74,000 before present, 74,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Toba explosion was the greatest volcanic explosion in history. So I have some recreations. Obviously, no cameras were around uh, at the time. And if there were, uh, they wouldn't have survived. Okay? So, but anyway, this is sufficiently dramatic. To give you an idea how great it was, just look at the comparative study. Most of you heard about Krakatoa. This was hundreds of times more powerful. St. Helens, most recent famous explosion, was unit one. This was 2,800. Now they're saying 3,200. So you can imagine the magnitude of the damage it could have done. So comparison, Tambora 1815, because it's in recorded history, caused global climate anomalies and vegetation loss. A long volcanic winter, hmm, and then uh, it became known as the year without summer in North America and Europe. Crops failed and livestock died. Okay, Toba explosion was about a thousand times more uh, this thing. Hmm? Six to ten year volcanic winter in India, followed by six thousand to ten thousand year freeze. Okay, all pre-Toba human populations wiped out. Most of them could not speak. A small group from Africa settled in India. We are all descendants of that group. Okay? All non-African humans descended from this group dating to about 50,000 years before present, maybe 60,000 years. We don't know exactly. I mean, uh, fossil, you know, they have not been reconciled yet. Evidence in India, archaeologists discovered buried layers of Toba ash in Narmada Valley, uh, not far from here. Hmm? At Bori and Murgao sites near Pune, southern Andhra Pradesh, far away as Thar Desert. Toba was two orders of magnitude. That means uh, 100 times uh, more destructive than Tambora. Ash layer around 15 centimeters, that is 6 inches. Okay? All human and related humanoid species uh, were eliminated. India was totally depopulated. People lived in India 
uh, uh, Paleolithic people lived in India 200,000 years ago, but none, none of them exist anymore. So this is what the scenario ash dispersal looks like. Here is one more ash dispersal. See how extensive it is. Recently, one of uh, there are some who dispute it could do any damage, but we know how much damage Sambora did. So something that is 100 times that great uh, would do a lot more damage. Okay. Only a few Africans survived. Okay. <coughs> And what did Topa do? It wiped out as much as 99% of the global human population, reducing the population from a possible 60 million to less than 10,000. All human species, except, etc. Of these, about 1,000 or so made it to India along the Arabian coast. Please understand what it means. India is the source of all non-Africans in the world today, but only 1,000 people existed in all of India. Why only a thousand people? Not only that, they lived in such small numbers for the next 10,000 years during the uh, post-Toba freeze. Why? In a very small area, so there was a single language sufficient for them. So that means the number of people you have in within one square kilometer, that was the total population of India at that time. All of us are descended from that. Our genes tell you that. You, you see the extraordinary thing? That means one language would have been enough. Hindi is enough for Indore, one language. So that one language was the language that because they already had language, because the, the what do you call it, the, the transcription gene, Fox P2 mutation had taken place, we already had language. That shows the evolution must have taken place in only one place. Because every human species today, every human population today can speak. Uh, we, it, is our gen, it is genetically ingrained. So that means the same mutation. We are all products of the same mutation. So the uh, human evolution could not have taken place, at least of our species, in different places at different times at exactly the same time. The probability of that is very small. So that one mutation, uh, and that gave us a huge survival advantage. Okay? So of these, a thousand of two uh, are our ancestors. Uh, so, etc. 80,000 BP, Eurasia, uh, and many that migrated earlier did not survive. Uh, only Neanderthals survived until about 25,000 years ago. There are minor differences. The Neanderthals might have been able to speak. They might have interbred with humans. That is still disputed. But they have not survived. There were no Neanderthals in India. At least no traces have been found. If any fossils are found, then we will have to change our opinion. We can't stick like, uh, you know, these Aryan invasion theories. All right, there is no evidence, but still there was an invasion. That kind of thing. We can't, you know, as scientists, you can't take that kind of an attitude. Um, Neanderthal, we are not clear. Uh, so this I already mentioned, and uh, the world entered a 10,000 year or longer ice age, and then a dramatic warming began about 52,000 years ago. Please note that all these are facts of science. We have evidence for this. This allowed vegetation, animals, and human populations to expand and move about in India, okay, which is the only country populated now. Humans in India survived as a very small group of 1,000 or less for 15,000 years. This is known as genetic drift. Some of you, I'm sure, are aware of it. So they developed that first modern language. So if we call the language that the, our African ancestors brought, brought here, we have called it Afro-Indian. Then the Indian language came into existence. Because the population was small, in a small area, a single language would have sufficed. This is what we have called proto Gauda Dravida. Here I have an appeal to all scholars, please do not use word Arya to mean North India or any geographical region. North India, the traditional name is Gauda, Dravida means South India, whether it is language or people or geography. Gaudadesha is North India, more often applied to Bengal proper. Gauda Brahmanas are Pancha Gauda. Dravida Brahmanas are Pancha Dravida. They lived by fishing and as hunter gatherer tribes during this period. Language made civilization possible. So we, now we are in South Asia, that is the Indian subcontinent. Uh, we already saw that 99% of the humans. Only hu the important effect of Toba is only speaking humans survived. Other human populations, humanoid populations disappeared. 
so as the freeze began to thaw, the population and territory both expanded. That means they lived as and animal populations also increased due to improved climate. A combination of overexploitation and faunal extinction forced them to move north in search of better hunting ground. This happened about 45,000 years ago. Okay? The first wave after that was about 45,000 years before present. Small groups moved into Eurasia and Europe, taking the northern route. That is the Khyber Bolan passes to Central Asia, uh, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and all that. They took also their language. This language that had evolved, maybe one, more than one, this was the first proto-Indo-European. Not 5,000 years old, 45,000 years old. We have no idea what that language was like. No matter what they claim. But you see the, the orders of magnitude. You see that the time scale involved are 1,000, 10,000 years, 20,000 years, 30,000 years, etc. 10 times more than what linguists have been telling us. Mm -hmm. This was the first proto-Indo-European. No traces of it survived. But we do have some interesting thing. You have art remains in Bhimbetka, not far from here, near Bhopal. And you have art remains of the same people when they went to France and created similar art in France. Whether it can give some glimpse into their language, I don't know. Okay? Uh, we have no trace of the head lab. All we know is they had language, which they took with them. Because they had language before they came here. This was the first Indo-European are more properly Afro-Indo-European brought into India by their ancestors and their offshoot that moved into Af uh, Europe. That does not explain the similarity between Indian and European languages. I'll get to that next. Okay. Here is something very important and radical we must recognize that North Indian languages which we call Gauda family and the South Indian languages which we call Dravida family are more intimately related than Indian and European languages. There the vocabularies are somewhat similar. Here the words are pretty much the same. I, I, I come from the south. You know, I speak Canada at home. Uh, I, have, I have a smattering of Tamil and Telugu also. The vocabularies are very similar. Hindi vocabulary is not very different from Canada vocabulary. The grammars of North Ind South Indian languages are very similar. You can take a good sentence in Canada and translate it into Hindi, it becomes a good sentence. That is not possible with uh, European languages. The grammars are different. Okay? And then the next major movement was around 10,000 years ago when the Ice Age ended. Okay, in that, that means from, for 30,000 years, from the time of the Proto-Indo-European, uh, the languages in India continued evolving. And that was the period in which Sanskrit and Vedic were created. Please note that these are not natural languages, but these, uh, that's why it is called Samskrita. Okay, two important developments. Uh, uh, one, agriculture made much larger populations possible, and many areas that were uninhabitable became habitable. Okay, so uh, domestication, pigs were domesticated in India, cattle, sheep, and hearts also was probably domesticated in India, and consolidation of languages by fusion. Vedic Sanskrit was created by a fusion of Gauda and Dravida languages. You, the great perfection of Sanskrit language and grammar is because of this very great care taken as you create a branch of mathematics. Hmm? Consolidation, Samskrita means compiled or constructed. Okay? The population of India expanded several regional languages and then we call them Gauda Northern Languages and Dravida Languages. The Arya should never be applied to your language because it represents neither language nor geography nor people. The sages created a composite language by combining elements from all existing languages. It's a fusion. Okay? So this is the reason why South and North Indian languages uh, share many of their grammatical features and vocabulary. So the second wave of Indo-Europeans was after, uh, towards, the, uh, towards the end and after the Ice Age ended. And they took with them the languages by then were close to Sanskrit. That is the reason you find Sanskritic elements in Greek, Latin and all those languages. So impact of the second wave is perceptible. We find the influence of the second wave out of India in animals. 
of Indian origin, including parasites like mice. Mice also, being a parasite, moved with agriculture. And the European mice, genetics tells you, is a descendant of the Indian mouse. Uh, so it's an interesting piece of evidence. Uh, and of course, you find it in mythology, which is more nebulous, but in vocabulary of European languages. One of the more interesting, when the, some Russian friends came there, I pointed out that the word vodka comes from the Sanskrit udaka, and both mean the same thing. It means it's water. Okay. Uh, so let me summarize what we have seen so far. Toba in 73 KBP, Toba destroys humans and vegetation in South Asia, giving rise to a 6,000 uh, year volcanic winter. Groups of Africans settle in South Asia and along the Arabian coast. This raises an interesting point. The Arabian coast, a small group, founder group, might have prospered, giving rise to languages like Babylonian, the Semitic languages which are quite different from Indian languages, but we, don't, we haven't made a comparative study of the roots. And uh, uh, then there was the cold period uh, from 65 to 52,000 years ago. Uh, the population and habitation increased. Migration east to East Asia, Australia. There is another story to be told about the East Asia. Because what happened, people moving to uh, Europe and Eurasia uh, which gave rise to Indo-Europeans, similarly in East Asia and all that. Not, in, not the more recent one. Now, of course, when you go to East Asia, Indonesia, Cambodia and all that, it's practically, uh, you know, it's like being in India. Okay? Uh, and then first Indo-Europeans around 45,000 years ago migrated in groups north and west in search of better hunting. Ice Age and second wave of Indo-Europeans take animals, agriculture, and also Sanskrit and related languages into Central Asia and Europe. So the, what happened, uh, this we have already seen. Oh, and, uh, yeah. So the people spread as determined by science. So this is the spread of people according to science. Okay. The two questions we have to answer. Why was India so pivotal? One, of course, fortune, uh, the blessings of nature. Uh, somehow they managed to survive because the, it's a tropical, I think the freeze didn't kill people the way it killed in other places. Uh, and, but geographically, land and sea routes, both east, west, and north, south, are accessible from India. That has made India always a very important thing. And because of its long coastline, India has been a maritime uh, nation. The climate is subtropical. It can support both tropical and temperate flora and fauna. If you come to a place like Bangalore, you will find uh, alpine varieties like pines and all that being able to grow, or go to Nilgiris. Okay? Uh, though a subcontinent, it has a long coastline and a long-standing maritime tradition. It has fertile soil and abundant rainfall. So summary of methodology, I would say from now on what we should do. Linguists have tried to explain Indo-European family by a migration based on language theories. Here the process is reversed. Science is used to account for movements of people and languages in response to natural events. Details can change, but no linguistic theory can violate this scientific framework. Unless a new framework is built based on data that is more reliable and more extensive, on the basis of existing data, almost to the day, this is the framework in which it has to go. Conclusion, I would say that Sanskrit has influenced both Indian and Eurasian languages. Indian languages can hardly exist without Sanskrit. So there must have been a very ancient Gauda Dravida language family uh, from which Vedic and Sanskrit evolved or were created. They did not evolve naturally. Indo-Europeans moved in two major waves. So this one. Final word, this is the current picture of civilization according to science. A gene mutation 80,000 years ago and a super volcano 73,000 years ago created condition for civilization to evolve. All non-African humans and their languages can be traced to a thousand or so survivors in India 60,000 years ago. This is my basic message and thank you very much for your patience.